Welcome to the Cohesive Home Podcast. Kate is officially on break for most of the month of April while she has her third baby. So I went ahead and found myself another Kate. (laughs) I'm just kidding. (laughs) You all know I would never replace Kate, but I am so thrilled to be interviewing Kate Flanders for our interview series. Kate Flanders is a financial blogger, a minimalist, and a fellow podcast host. In 2011, she decided to get serious about paying off her $30,000 in debt and began blogging her process. When she paid off the last of it in 2013, she further experimented with hacking her life by successfully completing a two-year shopping ban, got rid of 75% of her belongings to live more simply, and started the podcast Budget and Sense with Carrie Smith. She has some really cool projects in store for 2017, and I can't wait for her to share more of her story and her ideas with you. So here's my chat with Kate Flanders. Kate, it is so good to have you on the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And uh, so you're in Canada, right? I am. Yeah, I'm on the West Coast of Canada. Okay. Okay. And, uh, have you, has it like where you've lived your whole life? Uh, no. Well, I mean the majority of my life. Yes. But I, uh, like five years ago, I also moved out to Toronto, which is, uh, not the East coast, but it's like right above New York city sort Uh of. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I was out there for a year. Uh, otherwise I've been in this area of Canada. Yeah. Pretty much my whole life. Cool. Um, I read that or not read, actually, I think you talked about it on one of your podcasts, that you were staying in an area while you were writing your book where Twilight was filmed, I think. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. And actually, I just moved here. So now I live here permanently. Oh, my goodness. You did? Oh, that's awesome. Oh, I bet it's gorgeous. (laughs) Oh, yeah. No, it's it's pretty beautiful here. It's, um, It's something that, I mean, I don't think you appreciate until you leave and then come back. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's it's pretty special here. Yeah, I totally understand that. <laughs> it's kind of how when we were gone from Oklahoma, I was like, I'm, I'll never move back to Oklahoma. And now we're back in Oklahoma. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like you just have to leave a little bit to appreciate it, I guess. Yeah, or, yeah. So when you moved, was that around the time that you started your financial journey? Uh, I'd say it was actually right in the middle of it. If I look at like a timeline sort of, um, like I started paying off my debt around the middle of 2011 and then September, 2012, I moved to Toronto. So I had paid off at that point, like more than half of my debt. Um, I still had some of it, but, uh, not, not so much that it was quite as crippling as it had been before. Right. Right. You're still able to move and still pay down debt, which is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I finished paying it off, uh, in May of 2013. So yeah, I, it was, it was all circumstantial. Like I, you know, did things to save money, like in Toronto, I had a roommate and things like that. So I was able to just save on a lot of costs like that, but, uh, yeah, yeah. So right in the middle though. Okay. So a lot of our listeners have reached out to us for financial advice. I know we've uh, my, I should say my Kate, <laughs> uh, and I have, uh, kind of touched on the topic before and, you know, we've tried to emphasize that getting your values in alignment with your finances is a, a crucial first step. Um, but how do you, I know that in your podcast, you guys talk a lot about values and your financial goals. So, how would you tell our listeners um, how to do that, how to put your values and your finances sort of um, in alignment? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I mean, that's <laughs> a loaded <something>, question. <laughs> it, it is, but it's it's such a great one because I feel like Carrie and I have both dug even deeper into this um, topic this season. So yeah. that that is one thing just to say up front that I, I do sort of think it's always a work in progress, but I think that's a good thing. So yeah. the first thing I'll say is that um, 
there's there's this quote out there and I'm 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 so bad with like remembering who says things although people are misquoted all the time anyways but yeah. like um, <laughs> or they just put Gandhi after it <laughs> yeah so I I although I seriously I want to say it was Joe Biden but I'm probably wrong on that <laughs> so um anyways but there's this quote that says like show me your budget and I'll tell you what you value wow yeah um and I I think that is probably the first eye opener for a lot of people. I think one of the things I see just kind of repeatedly based on conversations, blogs I read, stories I hear, et cetera, like is that um, uh, the biggest problem people have in the beginning is they don't really know where their money is going at all, right? Like you just kind of spend and your bills get paid and things happen, but people don't really add up the numbers and look at, you know, how much you're spending in certain categories or, um, maybe are then not understanding why they're not able to reach some of maybe like the goals that they've set for themselves, um, or why they have no savings or why they can't seem to pay off that last like $500 of credit card debt or just all kinds of things. Right. And I, so I think <clears throat> the first thing that's very eye opening is if you just kind of track your money for a while and then can add up those numbers and really look at them. Um, but from there, I mean, I think something I've experienced is that you can't have goals unless you do have values. So I think, I think the values part has to come first. And I say that because, you know, I, I remember like paying off my debt was a really big goal. Um, I still, this is something I'm trying to unpack right now. I'm not really sure what the value was in it, except that I remember when I was, cause I was maxed out. I, I couldn't get more credit. Like I, that was it. And so I had to pay it off. Um, and I remember I had a lot of shame about that. And so the value might've been that I <clears throat> didn't want to feel that anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so I was just really working towards that. Mm-hmm. Um, but the problem was that when I was done, I just like when I was debt free, I didn't like, I couldn't really find a way to set goals, I would sort of set like the arbitrary ones that financial experts will tell you. So I would say things like, oh, I'll save uh, 10% or uh, 20% of my income or whatever. Um, But I didn't really have any goals for that. Like that was, or like any reason for why I was saving that money. Um, So I didn't do it. Like I just, I just didn't because saving 10% for whatever. What? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, why would you bother? Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, I then spent the next year, yeah, even a little bit more than a year, spending the majority of my income again. So I wasn't going back into debt, but I was basically spending everything. Um, and I would, I would get to the end of the month and maybe say that I'd saved like 5%. And even that, it was more just kind of like keeping a buffer in my checking account, like maybe saving a little bit for retirement, but I just, I don't know. I just wasn't. Um, and so I think it didn't start coming up for me until after when I really started to ask myself, like, what do I really want in my life? And not just what the financial experts say. Like, I think it's great that experts kind of give you these like goalposts to potentially work towards, but what do you want, right? Like what, what do you value? What do you want in your life? And so it, I started asking myself a lot of those questions. Um, and only from there was I then able to start setting financial goals. Awesome. I, that I absolutely love that. Um, well, so what did you figure out for yourself? Cause I know, um, you are, I mean, you're not married yet. You don't have kids yet. And so from that standpoint, what did become your values? You know, how, what were some of the things that you decided that you wanted to pursue and you wanted to, um, have those financial goals for? Yeah. So I think for me, it sort of became pretty obvious right away. And it was really looking back at things I had always talked about wanting, but had just never been able to allocate money towards. So I never traveled in my twenties. Like they talk about how you should travel after high school or after college. Um, I never did that because I always had a bunch of debt Yeah, and, and the debt was also my choice. Like I was placing (laughs) value on living this life that I couldn't afford back then. Um, and 
that that was my value back then. And so I really realized, though, that I'd never gotten those experiences. So I started allocating money towards travel. Um, and I also realized at the same time is when I decided to do the shopping ban. And the shopping ban helped me figure figure out, A, that I value travel, but also that I don't value stuff. Like I don't, if it means, and because I do think you have to make some compromises, like not to say, oh, you can't have it all, but I don't know that you can have it all at the same time. So for me, I was like, what do I value? What I want right now is to travel. So nothing else matters. Like this other stuff to me doesn't matter right now. Like buying more things or keeping up with trends on clothes or electronics or anything like that doesn't matter to me right now because I've never been able to travel. So this is my goal. Um, so I started allocating what money I could, uh, towards travel, which ended up being about over a year, about 18% of my budget, oh. which is a lot, a lot of money. But yeah. again, I, I didn't buy anything that year. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. so that was one. And then I do, uh, value the idea of retirement or just retiring co- more comfortably than just with like, you know, the government subsidies that you could get and stuff like that. So, yeah. and because I'm, uh, now self-employed, which I guess we could also talk about, oh, but like, yes, um, <laughs> cause that all, that also happened. Like it also became something I decided I wanted to work towards, but I knew that I, you know, I'm never going to retire with a pension or anything like that. So retirement is in my hands. Um, and so I, I did start to value that. So also in that year, that first year, um, I put 31% of my income towards retirement Whoa. and I ended up, yeah. And then I ended up living on only 51% of my income. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. <laughs> that is absolutely. And you traveled. And I traveled. Yeah, it was like, yeah, that was the breakdown. It was 51 living, 31 uh, retirement, and 18% travel for That's one year. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I am interested to know, you did a two-year shopping ban that um, Mm -hmm. our listeners can actually uh, read more about on your website. Um, But just the gist of it, you did one year and then you decided to take on a second year and this is all while still traveling. So uh, what I'm interested in is how in the world did you have a shopping ban and also travel? Because I feel like when, and especially with kids and I know you don't have kids, but like with us, I mean, you have kids. I'm like, Oh, okay. Now I have to buy all of this stuff to go travel with, right. Or to go camping or, Mm. and you know, you don't need it sometimes, but also you think, no, I do need that. I do. That is something that will help me travel or help me camp or, you know, do these, these excursions that you want to do. So how are you able to have a shopping ban, um, and also travel. So I think one thing that I learned pretty quickly was that I was going to have to start getting comfortable with using the secondhand economy. Um, and some, some of that literally just meant like borrowing stuff from friends. So I remember I went on a bunch of trips where I borrowed, um, a girlfriend of mine's like, uh, Oh, I, words aren't coming to me. Um, but just like carry on luggage. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I didn't, I didn't want to check luggage. Right. So I was like, I would, I would prefer to just use carry on. And so I borrowed it from my girlfriend every time. Like, I think I borrowed it from her like three times Um, and stuff like that. And also because like luggage is one of those things that you should like share with friends. Like it's so expensive or like for what it is and you don't use it all the time. It just sits there. Yeah. (laughs) I know I have like three suitcases in our garage right now because we, we needed them to come back from Germany and it's like, they, we don't use them. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I think, um, stuff like that really helped. I also didn't go on a lot of trips where I would have needed camping gear, but actually what was interesting was that by the end of the two years, I actually realized that one of my values was spending more time outdoors, including going on like overnight backpacking and camping trips. Um, and so once the shopping van was over, I had saved like this pool of money, uh, actually like also on top of that from things I'd sold around my house or kind of extra money I'd made here and there. And I would just kind of thrown it into this account. 
Um, and so one of the first things I did when the shopping ban was over was uh, I bought a tent and I bought a new awesome. sleeping bag and stuff like that. And so I was able to do that when the ban was over. Um, mm-hmm. But I still I could have done it during the trip. I just think it would have or during the shopping ban. I think it just would have been boring from friends a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so then you were traveling, you did your two-year shopping ban, which I still think is so cool. Um, But then you, is how do I say this? When did you embrace um, more of a minimalist lifestyle? Was this during the shopping ban or was this before the shopping ban? Oh, yeah. I did it all at the same time. (laughs) He just dove right in. (laughs) And I think it's sort of interesting. So like I said, like I had paid off my debt. And then for the year that followed, I was, you know, spending just way too much money Mm -hmm. um, and sort of came to this conclusion that I wanted to kind of experiment with uh, living off as little as possible, trying to save a lot more and just appreciating what I already had. Because I think that that was another reason I was spending money all the time was I just didn't understand that I already had enough. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I I literally on the, <laughs> on the same day, it was like my 29th birthday, I just wrote this blog post where I was like, so I'm going to do a shopping ban for a year. I'm also going to declutter and get rid of tons of stuff, mm-hmm. which sounds like totally backwards, like getting rid of things at the same time that you can't buy more. Yeah. Um, but I really, it was very easy to look around my home and see how much stuff I had that I didn't use. Mm-hmm. Like it, it was everywhere. I had also in 2013, so a year before I started the shopping ban, I had to move like I think like five times. And when you move that much and you like move boxes and boxes and boxes of stuff Mm -hmm. over and over again, and you never really open those boxes, (laughs) use what's in them. Like it, it becomes very obvious how much stuff you have that you don't need. Uh, and so, yeah, so I, I sort of did it all at the same time. (laughs) I think that's awesome. Well, and sometimes that's what it takes. It's like just diving right in and not asking any questions, just going for it, you know? And so I think it's great that you kind of ripped off both those band-aids at once. (laughs) You're like, I'm going minimalist and I'm doing all these other things. Well, it also really helped actually, because at the same time that I started getting rid of a lot of stuff, I sort of took like an inventory, which I don't keep, like I don't, I don't have anything like this now, but, um, I took inventory of how much stuff I was keeping and, that really helped me during the shopping ban because anytime I would even think of like, oh, maybe I need like lotion or toothpaste or yeah. just something random, I could in my head I could just be like, nope, I totally have like four bottles of that at home already. Yeah. Or just stuff like that. So it actually it ended up really being beneficial for a lot of reasons that I did it at the same time. Oh. Cool. So okay, so leading up to this big moment of like you're you're just diving in, um, I read on your blog that you said it wasn't just this big moment. It was kind of like a lot of little moments leading up to that. I don't know if you want to share a little bit about maybe some of those moments um, as to why you did this. (laughs) Yeah. uh, Like the decluttering part. Yeah. Decluttering, just getting into minimalism, just all of that. I mean, obviously I'm sure your financial journey was the catalyst, but, um, were there other moments within your journey that you said, okay, this is leading me to the, these decisions? Oh yeah. I think, I mean, if I look back at a lot of the changes I've made in my life, they've all sort of come from having a lot of little moments repeatedly come up where you think I should make this change. Mm -hmm. And then one day, like you just have to, yeah. Um, I mean, certainly with my finances, that was the case back in the day. Like I just used credit cards, like they were free money. And literally every time I would swipe, I would have this feeling like I shouldn't be spending this money right now, but I would do it anyways. Yeah. Um, and then the balances crept up and, and I was ignoring the statements and like stuff like that. Like I just, 
there were a lot of little little signs Mm -hmm. um and then yeah with the decluttering it was a lot of stuff like I mean ones that were just so simple like I remember trying to like look for and and I'll also say like I'm someone who's pretty organized and like my friends would always like call me a neat freak so it was sort of interesting that this stuff started happening but I would be looking for like the one black tank top that I owned and all I could find were like the six that didn't fit me anymore. (laughs) And, and, and how many times repeatedly I would be like going through my drawers and thinking like, Oh, I never even wear any of this stuff. And yet you just keep going through it, not actually dealing with it. Um, so stuff like that would just happen a lot. I mean, (laughs) the the final moment, it was just such a silly one. Like I always wish it's a, it was a better story, but I couldn't find a can opener and I am one person who lives in a one bedroom apartment and I have (laughs) one drawer that the one can opener lives in. So I'm like, this should not be happening. (laughs) Why did I lose the can opener? (laughs) Uh, And I remember that was like it for me because then I was searching through everything. And I think, I think that was the day it just did it for me. Like, going through so much stuff, looking for the one thing I actually needed. And all I could see was all this stuff I barely ever used. Mm -hmm. And, and so, yeah, it was, it was just, you know, months and months probably of thinking I should get rid of some of those things. All the moves I had done where I had looked at all that stuff, but never dealt with it. Um, and then one day I'm just like, I I can't, I can't anymore. I can't do this anymore. (laughs) Oh man. I know that feeling. Um, (laughs) so on your website, you have the, mindful budgeting worksheet and then also a mindful budgeting planner with these tools that you've created. Um, obviously you have some insight into minimalism and personal finance and melding those two together. So for our listeners, is there any advice that you could give someone, um, that's new to personal finance and that might have a lot of debt and wants to be more intentional with their money and their life, you know, what would, what would be some first steps that they could take to, um, sort of meld those two together. Right. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to the money stuff, I think that the first thing that I would tell anyone to do is, uh, just start tracking. And it does not have to be pretty. Like you don't have to buy the planner and have it look nice or anything. When I started tracking my spending, I used an old notebook that, you know, the I only had kind of 10 or 12 pages empty left in the back. And I just scribbled in it every day, every amount of money that I spent. I scribbled it down, <clears throat> wrote what it was or what, what sort of category I might have placed it under. Um, and I just did that for months. And the simple act of writing something down is just like, there's just nothing like it there. It, and especially, you know, it's sort of like how I was just saying, you have lots of moments that once they add up, it eventually forces you to kind of change your mind, um, or come, come to a new conclusion. And so for this, like, I feel like tracking my spending, it just very quickly became apparent that I was spending too much in different categories. And by spending too much, I literally mean it has nothing to do with what the experts said. It's that I didn't like how it felt to write down that I was like, let's say going to Starbucks every day, which I was doing back then. Like in 2011, I went to Starbucks once or twice every single day and I didn't like writing that down. And so I was like, the more I was doing it, it then became apparent that I wanted to cut back. So I just started to naturally. Um, so I think, I think there's just an awareness there that like writing something down versus just plugging it into a spreadsheet or something like that. Like it's just the daily act of doing it. And later for me, it became a weekly thing. I would only do it weekly, but those first few months of doing it daily changed everything for me. Um, so I would always recommend starting with that and really paying attention to how you feel. Like I, as much as I will always say, you know, money is just a tool and it does help you just live the life that you want. I, I am fully aware of how much emotion there is in it. And, and especially things like if you feel like you're not doing the right thing, how much shame there is in it. And shame can very quickly spiral into 
just more self-destructive behavior. So I just think like really paying attention to how you feel about something, cutting back what feels most natural to you, not to what anyone else says. Um, and, and starting to go from there, because from there, then you like, once you start to build your awareness, then you can ask yourself the questions of like, what do you really want? And what do you value? Again, not what other people value or say you should value, like what's important for you and your family, not anyone else's. Um, and then you can kind of start moving forward with goals, whether it's paying down debt or saving for something in particular. Um, but it's, it's very personal. Like that's kind of why I love personal finance because it is extremely personal. So there's, there's not really a one size fits all solution. Um, but just being more mindful and aware of where your money's going is where you have to start. I think. Yeah. Yeah. That's very, very smart. I love that. Um, so uh, one of the main things that you're, um, talking about on your blog this year is your year of slow. Is that right? Did I get it yeah, right? <laughs> um, yeah. And I feel like that would just go hand in hand so nicely with finding your values and finding what um, you personally or your family, whatever situation that you're in, um, figuring out your financial goals, um, doing this monthly um I would even call it a habit in a way. You're kind of forming these new habits each month. And so would mm -hmm. you share a little bit about your year of slow? I just think it's so cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's sort of, um, I will fully admit, like came from feeling a ton of anxiety as I was entering 2017. Like I could sort of see in my life that some things were shifting and I was going to have a lot more work to do and like projects I was excited about, but then it was it was just going to be different. It was going to be a lot more than I had done the year before. Like 2016, I was able to not relax, but like just kind of scale back on a lot of work and live a little more. Um, and I knew 2017 wasn't going to be able to look quite the same. So I just, I don't know, I had a ton of anxiety entering this year. And so there were just lots of ways, like, I okay, it just sort of came from knowing that the only way I was going to be able to get through it is if I did take things a little slower and be more intentional with them, like I don't, I didn't want to just rush through everything. Now I still don't, I don't know, maybe one day I'll become crazy enlightened and I'll be able to like <laughs> be mindful, intentional in every single decision I make. I'm certainly not advocating that that's po possible right now. Yeah. Um, but to be able to be a little bit more mindful and intentional is never a bad thing um, <clears throat> and can certainly help ease anxiety. Yeah. So <clears throat> I started it with um, like in January, I was heads down writing a book and I I couldn't really do much else. So my goal for January was just to have a slow morning every day. And awesome. it, it still looked a little different every day. Like sometimes a slow morning still was like only 15 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, that sounds wonderful, honestly. <laughs> yeah. 15 minutes. <laughs> totally. So I'm like, it's not like I, you know, relaxed for an hour every day or anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was just, you know, really enjoying um, my first cup of coffee or uh, listening to an audiobook or a podcast for the first 10 or 15 minutes of my day or um, just stuff like that and even little things that just made me feel better but I was putting off for whatever reason like making my bed yeah like I, <laughs> I can't tell you how good it felt every night to go to back to bed and be like ah oh, my yeah. bed is made like yeah. it didn't feel like I feel like a messy bed yeah you feel you feel stressed getting into it yes um, I completely agree <laughs> with that completely yeah so that was part of my morning routine um so yeah I had slow mornings for January which which did just help it just kind of set the tone for the day like I knew I had a ton of work to do every day but at least I got to enjoy a little bit of time in the morning yeah um, and then February was slow money, which was just that I hadn't checked in with myself on my values, my goals, um, and, and even just kind of like the accounts and financial products I was using and like stuff like that. And I really wanted to get very intentional about what my money looked like this yeah. year. Um, 
And yeah, so I mean, it, again, some just interesting things that came out of that was like realizing I totally have been dealing with a scarcity mindset when it comes to money for probably my entire life. Wow. Um, so I've just had like all kinds of things come up, but it was very interesting. I wouldn't have figured that out. I don't think if I hadn't really kind of spent the time to intentionally look at all of that. Um, and then March I called slow moving because I moved in March. Um, and I didn't want it to be as rushed or, um, or just like, I didn't want it to be the same as every other move I'd done before. Like I've moved so many times and I knew that where I was going was the place I really wanted to set down some roots and build a life. I also picked a city where the community here has a lot of my values. So very much values living over working, uh, being outdoors, um, being part of the community. Like that's very important here. Yeah. And, and no yeah, so there. I just, yeah, <laughs> that sounds amazing. <laughs> I'll come visit. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, so yeah, so I, I knew that I wanted to, you know, only bring this stuff that kind of would fit in with that lifestyle. Yeah. Um, I didn't want to bring clutter or anything that was just kind of at odds with my values. So I took it slow. Um, I'm, it means I'm sort of here with like a half empty apartment. I don't have yeah. <laughs> all, all the furniture I need and stuff like that. Um, but I also, I, I don't know, like this time I just, I don't want to just go out and buy something big and brand new. I want to, again, what I talked about earlier, like utilize the secondhand economy. I have zero issues with buying something used. Yeah. Uh, also as someone who has given away 75% of her stuff, I know there's really good stuff out there being given away or being sold for super cheap. And it's just because those people don't value it anymore, but yeah. it's probably like brand new, like the stuff I, the stuff I gave away and donated and sold was like in brand new condition. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I know it's out there. So I'm, I'm fine with taking the time to like find the right pieces that I want. Um, and April is man, April's going to be a big one. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I sort of had to come to terms with what I was dealing with at the beginning of the year, which was that I had a lot of anxiety. I've never identified as someone who like had any anxiety, but when I look back now, like I'm sort of just at this place in my life where I'm like, okay, I've actually been dealing with this for a long time. Yeah. Somehow I've been coping with it fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But right, right now I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, so I called April slow breathing because I think it, I'm finally at the stage where I'm realizing I actually need to find some mindfulness tools like meditation or yoga um, and not be doing them just because like everyone else does them. Like right now, I actually feel like I really need them. Yeah. Um, so just, yeah, but like still not setting crazy goals of like, I have to do a 30 day challenge and do it for like an hour every day or anything like that. Just making more practice, like building up some practice around it. Yeah. Being um, mindful of it for that yeah. month. Yeah. 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 Kinda, so. Yeah. That, I mean, I feel like creating, um, even habits, uh, based on those, like you picking one value that you want to get better at, you know, and then just like throwing that in for that month. I think that's, and just being mindful of that for that whole month. I think that, uh, sometimes, especially getting into minimalism, you, you see all of these things that you need to do in order to kind of like have a checklist of what minimalism is. And I know oh, I hate that. it's so <laughs> frustrating. Kate and I have even talked on another podcast before about how it, it's like a pet peeve of ours to see these, like do this checklist and you'll be a minimalist. And you're mm -hmm. like, that's not what it is. It's like, um, and, and so the fact that you're melding like your values along with minimalism and reaching financial goals. I mean, it's just, um, I just love how you're doing that. And I think that, uh, the year of slow, I, I really, I want to do it. So do you have like a list on your website of what next month will be, or is this something that you kind of just tell your readers every month and then they can, you know, if they would like to do it too, they can, or do you suggest picking something different or how do you, how do you talk about that? Um, so right now, like for this year, it's really personal because if I 
uh, it's funny right at the beginning someone asked me if I would like create a checklist and like all these things and I was like I am literally going based off what my gut needs right now Mm -hmm. I like especially April was the biggest one for me like and and even moving because I didn't know I was going to move in March that wasn't the plan like on January 1st so (laughs) um I didn't know that was going to happen um but for for April, I had literally written an entirely different post that explained um, I was going to do slow work. And and I have everything ready. Like I I have lots of stuff to talk about and a couple things to experiment with. And I will do that sometime this year and talk more about it. But I had to face what was really going on, which is that I was dealing with really intense anxiety. Like I, it had gotten to the point where I was walking around with like, honestly, in like a constant state of like fear and panic. And I've, I've never had that before. And I was like, this isn't like, it's not normal for me. And I can't live like this every day because I will lose my mind. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And I don't want my nervous system to get shot. I don't want you know, any, anything health wise to happen to me. Like, so I'm like, nope, that's what I need to do this month. And that's just, what's gonna, gonna have to happen. Um, so that being said, I do think I'll, I don't know, I'll probably try to put together some, some kind of list at the end, even if it's just the things that like the 12 topics maybe that I covered. Um, but yeah, cause I, I'm sure it would definitely be helpful for others right now though. It's like, it's way too, too deeply personal and every month I just sort of have to figure out what it is that I need like I'm really just that's something I I have learned repeatedly over the years is like how important it is to trust your gut when it comes to life changes that need to be made um and so every month that I'm really just like checking with myself being like what do I need right now and for me I'm like I need meditation yeah (laughs) so how is that going we're like a week into April right now while we're recording this Mm -hmm. uh how's it going so far um it's okay it is it's I have a ton of hesitation about it which is I actually think is probably very normal for people who are new to it and especially I'm I'm what I'm mostly doing so far is listening to a lot of podcasts and one audiobook where people are talking sort of about how they got started with meditation. So it's not just like all the how to's and whatever. It's just learning from some other people's experiences. And so I'm very much learning that this is very normal, like to feel um, resistance to it in the beginning is normal and uh, just stuff like that. So right now I'm sort of just exploring that. And actually, I had, I had kind of set some goals for myself and then I had a reader email me and she said, you know what, I would start super basic and literally just get yourself down on the floor on your yoga mat. Don't do anything. Just lay there, hang oh, out. Shavasana. And I was like, yeah, just lay yeah, there. <laughs> like, That's a really great idea. Like, yeah. don't worry about meditating or doing yoga. Just get in the practice of getting down on the floor. Yes. Uh, Cause that is where you need to go yeah. <laughs> to do the work. So like, just start hanging out there and yeah. then eventually you'll start getting comfortable with it. So I really liked that. And just like, so I'm just kind of taking in a lot of information right now. Mm-hmm. Oh, I really, really like that advice. She's really smart. She is smart. <laughs> <laughs> like, thank you listener. Yeah. Uh, um, okay. So while you're tackling each of these, monthly goals, I guess, for your year of slow, you're also writing a book, right? Mm -hmm. So, and can, I guess I've, I've read some on your website that the book is, I guess, mostly going to be about your, is it about your two-year shopping ban? Is that what you're writing about or you know, tell us about it? Yeah, it's called the year of less. So the timeline is the first year of the shopping ban because that's, I mean, that's definitely when I learned the most. Yeah. Um, the second year of the shopping ban was more because there were just some things that I kind of wish I had incorporated into it. And I knew I'd be comfortable living that way for another year. Um, so the first year, though, was definitely when I learned the most, when I decluttered and got rid of, like in that year, I got rid of 70% of my stuff and I've just gotten rid of a little more since. Yeah. Um, and so that's the timeline, but it really weaves in Ah oh, man, just like I'm in the editing stage right now. So it's so <laughs> it's so interesting, but it it just like weaves in sort of all these times throughout my life where I was consuming, like over consuming mm-hmm. other things and kind of the reasons why. 
and and then my experiments with consuming less of those things. So uh, one huge factor in it is that I used to drink and four and a half years ago, I quit drinking. Oh, wow. Um, and so I talk a lot about drinking when I was a kid, like growing up, what, what my relationship with alcohol was, um, even into my 20s. And then, you know, I didn't have that as a coping mechanism anymore and sort of what that was like. Um, yeah. so there's, there's a lot, but even just, I mean, I also used to like comfort eat and, uh, mm-hmm. just, just stuff like that. So <clears throat> over the years have become much more aware of the fact that I was doing those things, uh, and, and trying to change them. But yeah, so it's, it's a lot like it's, but I think it has to be that way. Like, I don't think, or it's just like a more inclusive look at it. Like, it's not just about, oh, that I didn't spend money or something for a year. Like, it's it's not about that at all. It was like all these other things that have also happened in my life. And then I went through some really heavy stuff that year that I I just didn't really talk about on the blog. Like, I went through a breakup that was pretty devastating. And uh, my parents got divorced, which was Ooh. completely unexpected. Like, I never saw it coming. Yeah. Um, so there was just a lot, like there, there was a lot going on. And so I just, yeah, weave in like m- way more of that, just the stuff I didn't share on the blog. Um, mm, yeah. and then, a, and then a lot of, yeah, memories and stuff from my past. So it's, it's been a major project. Um, wow. yeah, and- that's almost like cathartic in a way you're like really digging into your past. That's hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's been I mean, there are days where I'm just crying while I'm writing, <laughs> but I, it, it has been cathartic and I'm not, I'm still not just writing it for me though. I do think as a book that goes out, I think it, you need to have a bigger look at everything. Like it's yeah. not just a, like, I don't write like, just like, Oh, here's how to live on 50% of your income or something. Not that that's bad, but I think you really have to look at every, every aspect of it. Yes. Um, so, which yeah. is, yeah, I mean, that's kind of the point that we try to drive home you know, with cohesive home is it's all encompassing. It's not just one thing like that checklist. It's not, you know, it's not one road. It's so many different paths that kind of come together to create this journey. And so, yeah, I'm really excited to read it. You have to Thank you. Uh, keep us posted when that comes out or actually when, when does it come out? Do you know? Yeah, it comes out January 16th of 2018. Okay. All right. Well, we'll definitely let our listeners and readers know whenever that comes out for sure. Um, where else can they find you? Uh, I'm just Kate Flanders, but uh, Kate is C-A-I-T. It's okay. short for Caitlin. Um, but Kate Flanders at .com or at Twitter. Uh, I hang out on Instagram more than anything. Um, I love your feed. I know I'm not technically on Instagram anymore, but I can still like go online and check out Instagram feeds if they're public. Mm-hmm. And yours is so pretty. It's like, I want to be outdoors so bad when I looked at it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, definitely going outside. It's Yeah, it's actually been an interesting platform for me to think about because sort of what you were just saying, like, you know, how people are sold that like minimalism is like a checklist. Yeah. Like, I I'm very like, careful to not post things like what my house looks like or or like my home you know I'm careful not to post that stuff because that to me does has kind of nothing to do with it like in a way minimalism to me has almost nothing to do with how many things you own or don't own it's literally just are you living out your values yeah um Yes. And and like getting rid of the values that aren't important to you and just putting more energy into the ones that are. That's mm-hmm. that's it. So Wow. I could not agree more. And I think that is a great point to end with. So Kate, thank you so, so much for coming on our little podcast here and filling in for my other Kate. I appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> no, it was it was really great. Thank you everyone for tuning in for the Cohesive Home podcast interview series. Stay tuned for next week's episode and make sure to subscribe at cohesivehome.com or through any of your favorite podcast apps. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.